first of all, I'd like to say how fantastic it is to be here again after 10 years. And it's an illustration of how uh, a journey embarked upon is actually 90% of the uh, journey completed. And, um, you know, starting the AIMS, uh, even without knowing at that time that there would be a, a second one, uh, has been absolutely fantastic and truly impactful. The impact of these meetings uh, can be assessed in two ways. One is a deletion test. How would we have been without this? And the second is a gain of function assay and ask if we have more and different of this elsewhere where it hasn't reached, would that be valuable? And I think both assays would suggest that the YIMS have been extraordinarily uh, valuable and have potential. Um, like almost everything which is started, uh, not only in India but everywhere, when the idea of starting this young investigator meeting came up, I think uniformly, except for those who were actually organizing the meeting, the idea was that this is not going to work. Indeed, I would say institutional heads at that time were the biggest uh, negative force against this idea. They felt that, you know, okay, we'll come along uh, kicking and screaming, but, you know, these are not things which are going to be useful. There are a host of, you know, 20 other problems which need to be solved, which are, of course, important before uh, we uh, go anywhere ahead. Uh, but anyway, that said, the YIMS have been valuable, and as you know, they get better and better, people take more and more ownership, and now there's, I think, a sense of community uh, which will ensure that it goes ahead, and that's one very important goal which we should keep in mind, how to make sure that uh, the YIMS and the India Bioscience take on new challenges, including gains of function. Um, let's just pause a bit while admiring the extraordinary changes which have taken place in the Indian biology landscape over the last decade. And those changes, of course, are phenomenal. And as Jitu said, all of you in this room are largely responsible for this. And there's very exciting things already going on. You go to a cell biology or a neuroscience or a developmental biology or a bioinformatics meeting today, and there's a qualitative change in the science, uh, much higher quality, and there's a much uh, significant increase in the footprint of science. And both these are very, very good. And again, I think the facilitating role structures such as the YIM have made uh, are not to be underestimated. It um, certainly, in addition to linking people with opportunities, they have been very valuable in building a sense of community. But let's look at where we are today. Um, and I must again reiterate that when we look at that, we should not fret too much. There's a phenomenal uh, set of achievements which we have, and uh, you know, we shouldn't underestimate that. We have a tendency to think that somehow the past is perfect, uh, and the present is very tense, and the future uh, is imperfect, you know, and we don't know what it holds for us. But that's uh, not true. We selectively look at nice things in the past, forget all the travails which we underwent, and we are very stressed about the present because we have to deal with it, and we'd rather not grapple with the future because, you know, that's, you know, too many uncertainties involved. So that's human nature. But today we are in a situation where we have to, both as citizens of India and as global citizens, we need to worry about the future in a really big way. And the reasons are twofold. One is, we've heard already, the perception about science and technology. It's not just a perception about scientists and science and so on, but it's a atavistic view that somehow all the problems of today have been caused by science and technology. And there was a period sometime and people can define different times in the past. It can be, you know, 1600, 1800, you know, 1000 BC, whatever, when everything was perfect and we need to go back to that period. And this is the problem 
all over the world. This is the problem which assumes that somehow by getting rid of technology, one can solve problems. And this is absolutely true in a country. The solution is valid in a country uh, like Liechtenstein, uh, but it's certainly not valid in a country like India. The scale of our problems and the scale of our challenges are such that having a large backyard with a few horses trotting around and a vegetable garden to get your produce and a relaxed day is not a solution which is feasible even if you know, one wanted it in our context. When you go to Dharavi, uh, this is not a solution which will work. So somehow solutions to problems of scale need to come about and throwing away technology, which is a luxury which many richer contexts can afford, is not available to the poorer context. Yet, these richer contexts would propagate a viewpoint which is essentially anti-science. And this goes across political viewpoints, you know, uh, goes across uh, multiple societies. So the question is, what does one uh, do about that? So there's this view about technology being the cause. The other problem which faces us, one is this view about technology being a problem, is climate change. And this is a phenomenally huge problem. And the scale and the extent of the problem has actually been identified very carefully by extraordinary science and technology. It is true that human-induced changes in, in global temperature uh, are, of course, human-induced. And they have come about by our use of fossil fuels, uh, you know, a, a variety of other uh, you know, efforts which have ended up damaging um, the hole in the, creating a hole in the ozone layer and so on and so forth. But extraordinary measurements have been incredibly valuable in telling us that these temperature changes are not near minor fluctuations, that climate change is for real, and this is a, as um, you know, Amitav Ghosh says, is a runaway train. Now, if this is a runaway train, climate change and global warming, then there's not too much one can do. But the point is that there are two things which one can do. One is to mitigate the consequences of climate change and also ensure a future in this planet for our children and our grandchildren and so on. And that is a very real challenge which can be addressed only by policy changes and by science and technology. So at both levels, we have a huge problem on our hands. One is a distrust of science and technology across the cent uh, spectrum, and the other is that policy changes through articulation of quality science and technology and use of available science and technology are needed to save the planet. In that context, while we must celebrate our extraordinary achievements in Indian biology, it seems you know, less than a drop from the ocean about our being able to address these bigger issues. And that is really going to be the substance of much of what I want to convey at this stage, that we are and should be justifiably proud of the extraordinary science we have done against huge odds, the institutions we have built, the students and postdocs we have trained, and how they populate new institutions. This is something to be very, very proud of. This is not a minor achievement. This is an achievement over the last two and a half, three decades, which has been truly transformative. Indian science, as a consequence, has a respect. Indian biology has a respect disproportionate to the level of investment made and disproportionate to the absolute numbers of papers and so on and so forth and where they are published. I mean, this has been very valuable because of this huge investment in time and effort in training people and building a culture of collaboration. Uh, and that's been incredibly valuable. That's important. But it is still a very small drop in the ocean compared to the kinds of problems which you need to address. For example, when we talk about cell, molecular, and developmental biology, neurobiology, and so on, we don't have in this room a significant number of people who represent areas which are very critical and important to basic or applied biology. By the way, I don't make a distinction between the two. I'll tell you why later. But we don't have representatives in agriculture, energy, health. Uh, marine biology is itself a little uh, poorly represented in the country. Evolutionary biology and ecology, even though it's growing, needs a much larger presence in terms of other interactions. 
these are areas where the dominant bench biologists seem to assume uh, is, are areas which are magically done by some other people. We are not the people involved. Our work, for example, in tuberculosis would largely be on the tuberculosis of the f and of tube uh, and linked very minimally to you know, what's happening in the country. Similarly, our work on vaccines and so on and so forth doesn't link to vaccine you know, development at a level of testing and doing. And there's extraordinary work in these areas going on in the country. It's not that it's not going on. They're not represented in our space as much as they could be. Now, in that situation, how has biology developed? Why do we have this mindset? We have this mindset. There's nothing wrong in it. I'm just saying it's not sufficiently inclusive. Because of the kind of effort which have been put in, whose traditions we follow. And those efforts um, are those which have names behind them, and I think we should you know, celebrate uh, many of those names. For example, uh, if you look at plant biology, uh, Panchanan Maheshwari's work, followed by that of B.M. Jory and others in Delhi University, was phenomenal and globally recognized in plant embryology. That's, that's a tradition which many of us have forgotten about. Uh, we are here in Kerala um, and very close by, um, Janik Yamal was born here in, I think, 1897. She studied botany in Presidency College and went on to um, uh, become a botanist in Michigan. Uh, she was brought back from the U.S. Uh, by Nehru in the 50s to help uh, develop the botanical survey, did a phenomenal job over there. But those traditions in plant biology in particular and linking that to our ecosystem as a school uh, have had extraordinary pioneers who we haven't uh, followed up to scale uh, later on. And there are good reasons for that, uh, but that's something which we need to be uh, looked at. In another aspect of where we come from uh, are those uh, of um, people such as um, D.P. Barma, Bemal Bachavat, Pushpa Bhargav, the three Bs of biochemistry as it were, these people were responsible, among several others, to put in a very strong tradition of biochemistry in the country. That tradition developed a high quality set of people who went on to, along with the high quality chemists who came from other areas, to support the you know, um, natural products, uh, chemistry and biology industry, which India was at a time very strong in. The, the chemistry based industry was very, very strong, and, and that school uh, led to uh, the development of that industry. Um, it also led to a certain blinkered view about other changes which were going on in science at that time, dramatically in biology all over the world. And it had an opinion, I think well until the mid-60s or early 70s, uh, the biochemists of the Indian Institute of Science thought of DNA as an aberration. Um, and it took, really, Obeid Siddiqui's setting up of the molecular biology unit in the early 60s in Bombay to start making, putting genetics on a much stronger footing. Uh, there was also a tradition of Roy Chowdhury in Calcutta and then Banaras, which developed a school of genetics. But the school of genetics didn't grow as strongly as it could have in that extraordinary fertile times, but it did grow. So that's the other tradition. And the third tradition came from uh, physics, really, exemplified by uh, G. N. Ramachandran and his development of a school of biophysics, first at Madras and then at the Indian Institute of Science. And again, that combination of biophysics and biochemistry at the Indian Institute of Science led to a substantial growth of the Indian generics industry of which, I mean, India is probably the world leader in generics now, and that value of that uh, background training shouldn't be underestimated. So there's a whole lot of phenomenal achievements of science training, which is impacted in a broad way, which we should be more aware and communicate about. But similarly, there's been um, extraordinary application dependent um, uh, application-oriented successes, again, which we don't uh, necessarily talk about amongst ourselves or even communicate. For example, 
um, Shambhunath Day's essay for examining uh, cholera uh, was pathbreaking, and importantly, his discovery of the cholera toxin is really truly pathbreaking in both understanding the disease as well as uh, as a tool for understanding signaling. Um, that's been more appreciated uh, recently over the last decade or so. People have talked about it, but that's something again which we need to communicate more widely. Um, more widely. Um, another person who was exemplifies another school, and that school is from the Indian Statistical Institute in Kolkata, where because of Mahala Nobis's effort at setting up the collection and analysis of data, also resulted in the strengthening of genetics and biology, and that's a very unusual place. Uh, the ISI has had extraordinarily successful people who have contributed to genetics all over the world, but it's also had um, Ratan Lal Brahmachari who worked on tiger pheromones. Uh, he purified these pheromones, looked at tiger ecology, and studied the link between smell and behavior, you know, about 40 years ago in a large mammal, uh, and did a phenomenal job. He just died, I think, on February 18th or something. Uh, so Ratan Lal Brahmachari is another person who's had an enormous impact on the early days of what we today would call uh, chemical ecology. Another brahmachari, uh, also from Kolkata, looked at, uh, found a drug for, uh, for Kala Azar, which was very effective. So these are successes which were because of individuals who took on extraordinary interests in their problems and it's only some of them, not just these people, some of the list of people I've mentioned, who actually went on to start and develop institutions uh, of whose products we are. So there is a very strong um, tradition of that kind. In this tradition, what is the situation today? And Jitu alluded to some of that. But at the time of the development of this tradition, there was a situation where if someone were the head of CSIR or the space organization or the atomic energy organization or the Indian Institute of Science or the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, such people had extraordinary, or we'd like to think today, had extraordinary political access. And we think that that political access resulted in a golden period of Indian science and it's this lack of understanding of science by our politicians today, which we say is, is, is due to, uh, has resulted in a misperception of that science. Now, this couldn't be further from the truth. It is true that these people, whether it was Baba or Bhatnagar and so on and so forth, had access. India was a much smaller country in that sense. But that access didn't mean easier process. It, it was the exact same kind of battles we talk about today were battles which these people had to fight. Baba was told by a accounts, senior accounts officer at the Tata Institute that serving biscuits and coffee after a colloquium was a waste of money. Uh, and he had to argue this out on file and say that is much less expensive than serving wine and cheese, which he was used to. Uh, and so that, that was a battle you have to actually go through. Um, Shekhar Basu, the current chairman of the Department of Atomic Energy, was telling me how in Delhi, his office had a door which went directly, uh, the corridor led to a door which went directly to the Prime Minister's office, and how Nehru ostensibly used to pop in periodically and talk to Baba and then go on, and how those days are gone. But the fact of the matter is that the Atomic Energy Commission, even in those days, um, or, or you know, the Atomic Energy Establishment in those days, had to deal with a bureaucracy which, despite its flexibility, had you know, a very major stranglehold. I met a controller of defense accounts uh, some years ago who was uh, seconded to the Department of Atomic Energy. And when I told him that I was a graduate student at TIFR, he told me with great pride how for six years or seven years, he ensured that every file of Bhabas was delayed. And this was his measure of success. Uh, so so this, is, this is, you know, our administration and finance, and this is true all over the world, have always been 
in our minds, a problem. If you read, for example, um, Istvan Hargitay's book on the Manhattan Project, or how you know um, five Hungarians who didn't have uh, U.S. citizenship, who are green card holders, had to struggle to you know work for what they thought uh, was America. But the American generals, the establishment, and everyone else thought they shouldn't be allowed any access whatsoever. So bureaucracy stopping science is is always been there, and these people fought through, just as all of you are fighting through right now. That's why I say that the present looks extremely troublesome, but that's always going to be the case. It's only the past which we filter out and make perfect. Now, in that situation, um, what do we have today? What does the government think about science? Now, it's difficult enough to use think and government in the same sentence, but think, government, and science is a huge challenge. But you go to a parliamentary standing committee. You go and meet ministers across the spectrum. Two things stand out which are unusual in India. One, no matter what side of the political spectrum there are, there's an incredible trust in individual scientists when they come and meet people. That there is a deeper, deep level of respect and a deep level of appreciation of what's happening. There may be several questions which I'll come to. There are also multiple, so the Parliamentary Standing Committee, for example, puts in a huge amount of work before, like this is the right, this is the period, just before the budget is uh, you know, accepted, the Parliamentary Standing Committee would have reviewed all of science in the country. And they sit through several hours of discussion for each department and go through it thoroughly. And they come very, very well prepared. And one has to you know, argue out your case. So these people are not, as we would like to think, somehow disconnected with any sense of reality. It's we who are disconnected with them. And something needs to be done about that because they don't get any inputs from us about science and technology and applications and basic science and so on right through the year at all. The only inputs politicians in Delhi get from scientists, and they get this all over the year, right from the president of India down to uh, you know, the secretaries in every department. The standard input, 10 times a day, is complaining about how horrible their institute is, how horrible their director is, how horrible search committees are, how evil someone else is. This is the only statement which people receive. Never, ever a statement that something went right today. Not one. So if you have this barrage, and this is because of you know, the feedback mechanisms we have created. We have created laws and rules which require you know, processes to be in place. They are very valuable uh, laws and rules. Because of this, we have become addicted to a situation where we know that we are the best person for a particular job. If there are five people for that job, and there's one position, and four don't get it, my immediate reaction is to accuse the committee and the members of all sorts of things and send 20 letters, even as the committee meeting hasn't just, hasn't, and the minutes haven't even been signed. So the only feedback our politicians get about science, which is true, but they get the same feedback about everything else. But science is not special uh, in any way because we behave no differently from the kind of feedback others give. It's not just that individual scientists write this. This is a problem with science leadership. We have very little good things to say about anyone else, any other institution, right? Any other leader, any other policy, and so on and so forth. It's always da 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 da, but, and then the but takes on, you know? So we know, therefore, what is deeply wrong with our neighboring institutions. Uh, we never praise them, uh, but, that's, again, the kind of feedback which goes elsewhere. So whatever things anyone starts, uh, there's a problem. So we have a problem if excellence is supported, and we have a problem if capacity building is supported. Those in places of excellence will crib if you throw money to build capacity, they'll say it's a waste. And those in places where there's capacity building which is needed will be very upset if you support excellence because, you know, it's the same people getting the same thing again and again. And this, this is the only feedback which people in Delhi get. 
So unless we change our mechanisms of feedback in a manner where we combine our legitimate concerns about what's happening, that's very important, with an appreciation of the complexities and what needs to be done, we're not doing ourselves any favor. What do our politicians, not, not those in Delhi, elsewhere think about science? Typically, your MLA or MP will come to you if you're in an institution or if you're in, in Delhi and say, I'm from such and such a place, can you build an institution in my constituency or can you do something in my constituency? And our immediate reaction, I've seen this across the spectrum, is to say, you know, we have our processes, there's a specific set of rules, go away, uh, nothing can be done, you know? And uh, if, if something uh, happens, it'll happen according to our rules and regulations. And this is an extraordinarily pompous kind of interaction with our elected representatives. You don't need to do what that person is asking you to do, but you need to give a patient hearing and understand what can be done. The time scale for the response which an elected representative needs is a few years. That person has to get re-elected in five years. Your time scale is you know, 20, 30, 40 years. And somehow, if we constantly only convey that there's a mismatch in these time scales, go away, then when time comes for fund allocation, we should not be surprised that they don't see us as being significantly relevant. Um, so that's, that's the other aspect. So we need, when we talk about science communication, we must see that it, I used to think that science communication means communicating the importance, the value of science, and what you're doing, and so on and so forth to everyone. That's necessary, but it's just a very small fraction of the part of communication. A large part of communication is actually interacting with your local municipality and the elected representatives there, in your city, in the state, in the country. Do they know of your existence as, perhaps not as an individual, perhaps not as a specific institution, or at least a collective of institutions in that city? And if the answer is no, then there's a problem. And, and this is something which we need to change our communication strategy to include people. It's, it's risky, it's, of course, it's dangerous. Because when you communicate with politicians, that means they will expect something from you and you expect something from them. But that's the reality you have to deal with if you want things to change. What, so I've also already mentioned what we think of uh, politicians. So now, in this situation, <coughs> what is, is, is the future of biology in the country and what needs to be done? and who should lead this. Now, one of the problems which we have when we talk about the future of biology is that we need to convey that in a collective, in a manner where it's the future of biology as a foundational effort which is essential for the future of the country as well as the planet as I mentioned at the start. So our current conveying of what we need as biologists is largely that you know we need more monies, we need more flexibility and so on and so forth, all of which are legitimate, but they need to be articulated in addition with to something about what there's a broader narrative about. I'm pretty impressed how the astronomers, you know, the um, optical astronomy in the country, for example, which I think comp comprises about half a dozen or a dozen at most PIs have managed to get 1,500 crores, which is 10% of the cost of a 30 meter optical telescope in Hawaii. Um, this was something which went through all the hoops with effortless ease, because they talked about you know, how important it is to gaze at the skies. A corresponding effort by biologists to do anything basic or applied does not exist bottom down. This is a bottom up, sorry, bottom up. This, this is a bottom up effort. Similarly, the laser interferometric gravitational observatory again went through in terms of financial approvals at least without a huge problem as also did the Indian neutrino observatory, both of which have, you know, other problems but uh, or at least the Indian neutrino observatory has the other one doesn't. 
The point is that these were efforts which came from the physics community and pushed for large support. Similar efforts have taken place in vaccine research, in nutrition, in agriculture. But this kind of a setup has not come, come up with something exciting, uh, which is a collective. So it's all very well for us to talk about us being collective. We must share our mass specs. We must stand, uh, share our microscopes. Very important to do that, but I'd like to see that happen on a large scale. Uh, it doesn't happen even in one institution sufficiently, let alone between institutions. These are aspects which are, you know, we need to set our house in order and we need to be very active about this if one has to see a connection between us and the broader purpose of science and us and politicians and us and society. So, in summary, there is a poor expression of our opinion at the national level. Um, it is tough, it's not easy. It's all very well to say one must express our opinion to our politicians, who's going to do this? It's all very well to say that, you know, we must be involved in, you know, public efforts of various kinds. Who's going to do it? Are each one of us um, supposed to do it? And the answer is, of course, no. The example is that, um, I think about three years ago, when the current science minister took charge, he held a meeting at Dehradun uh, with CSR directors and the CSR director general. At that time, um, it was, I think, uh, Garg, and laid out a set of goals for CSR. And this involved taking on some national missions, taking on some projects of strategic importance, taking on you know, transfer of technology to industry, uh, doing research on frontier areas, and so on and so forth. And this was supposed to be CSR's entire mission. Now, the problem we, and this is a problem of our creation. This is fair enough, it's not a big deal. It's the entire Council of Scientific and Industrial Research and they can deal with it. What do we do with this? We take this and go back and give this to each of our labs, to the directors. Each lab then is expected to take on something of strategic value, work on four missions of national importance, three this, two this, one that, and two that. Very good. What do the directors of each lab do? They give it to each PI. So each of you are supposed to work on you know, three strategic missions, two this, three this, four this, and so on and so forth. So this is a you know, sequential abrogate, and, and then everyone from below moans, you know, how can we ever do this? This is a sequential abrogation of responsibility, which is not peculiar to CSIR. It is true everywhere. We have lost a sense of what institutional function is supposed to be. We, we transfer that institutional responsibility to each individual scientist. And therefore, we expect you, as a scientist, to clean up Belandur Lake, as opposed to some other level of granularity which is required for that problem. And then we have a result as a consequence of all of us talking about various problems in the commons, but none of us doing anything about it. We all know what needs to be done to cure tuberculosis, malaria, you know, in terms of public health, in terms of cleaning up our lakes, agriculture and so on, but none of us would be involved in it because it is really someone else's job. And someone else will blame someone else and so on and so forth. Right? And when we are given some responsibility, we will then you know, pass it on to a lower and lower level. And this is a fundamental issue about how we address problems of the commons, which we as citizens first and scientists second need to understand. And unless we grapple with that fundamental issue, uh, our viewpoint as scientists alone don't resonate with others. There are viewpoints of lawyers alone then, of, you know, bus drivers, of pedestrians, of everyone else. And everyone of that category has an opinion on how something needs to be fixed. So we need to move from being more than being expert journalists who can analyze any problem well, who know what the solution is, to actually participating in the solution. And this is a problem, because we can say this, but how are we going to do this? It's not feasible. There's no way someone who's working on um, intracellular trafficking in uh, Drosophila hemocytes 
is going to be able to, they might have strong views on how to, you know, clean up um, in some other health context, but they're not going to be directly involved, and it's, it's really, truly not their job. So my feeling is, unless we get a possible solution for these kinds of issues, we are not helping ourselves, and each of us will say that we are not the solution. Where is the level of that solution? And there, Ron's point is very important. He talked about a national institute, as it were. I would say, break it up into something very doable today. Bangalore, Hyderabad, Pune, these places, each of them can be one phenomenal institute. If the institutions in, how many, by the way, how many national laboratories are there in Hyderabad? Any guess, except from Jochna? Pardon? 35 or 37 or something, right? And I think 30, each of them doesn't know of the existence of any of the others. The CCMB and the Indian Institute of Chemical Technology collaborate hugely with the, on a crash and an auditorium. You know, important, but that is the principal level of collaboration. There's a little bit more here and there, right? So this, these are, you know, unless we break these structures and create institutional leadership, which allows each of you to flourish to do whatever you want, but that institutional leadership in a city, at least, or groups of institutions, take responsibility of some sort at a national level, we can bemoan how silly so-and-so is, what kind of statement they made about such and such an area, and so on and so forth, mocking others, no matter how justifiable and illog uh, that mocking may be and illogical their statement may be, doesn't do yourself any good. What are you doing as a community you know, fixing things which need to be fixed? How much sharing of even mundane things like sharing equipment, let alone sharing intellectual interactions, takes place in our environment. Now, to be sure, these are not fixes which can come overnight, but this requires a cultural change about our attitudes uh, to our city where we live and so on. We are constantly being accused of being a short walk from India. When we step out, we don't seem to think that that world belongs to us. And it's that attitude which is a problem, not even about us doing something about it, right? So our politicians, on the other hand, no matter how messy they are, no matter which party they belong to, have to deal with that messiness. And they see us as people who are divorced from that messiness. It's that communication gap across the political spectrum which is needed if we have to change views about science, both here and everywhere else in the world. And that is a big challenge. So I would suggest, in terms of practical things to do, is in the context of the extraordinary capability of people such as all of us in this room, is that we take on two kinds of national missions. One, fundamentally, is a national mission in basic science. We have to think a little bit more than just biologists. There's extraordinary biology, as I said, going on outside this room. There are a whole lot of engineers in the country looking at biology from a different perspective. There are those looking at you know, biology from a startup perspective. There are people looking at health and agriculture and energy. There's fantastic stuff going on which interfaces with biology, which we are relatively poorly aware of. But even going beyond that, we must encompass not just biology, but physics, chemistry, data science, computer science, and so on, to articulate exciting missions in basic biology, anchored in basic biology, which brings everyone in on a large scale. And that's really vital. So that's one aspect. It can be high-end, frontier science, but that's something. It can be done by a small number of people, but it should be symbolic of what our aspirations are. Other aspects such as you know, teaching, outreach, and so on need to be scaled up, and that's a different matter, but that, again, similarly can be done. It, again, you know, each one of us doesn't have to do this, but we as a community should be doing it. The ant hill should be organized without individual ants necessarily being involved in a big picture all the time. And we can be doing our wonderful little things, but somehow this organization needs to emerge, and it has come globally in some context, and we need to learn from that. So the quality of basic science needs to expand hugely, and increasing that footprint in multiple ways should be a major mission, and we need to articulate that, and we need to take our leadership there. The other is, you know, as Ron pointed out, 
if you look at our context, and that's why I don't like this distinction between basic and applied, there are extraordinary opportunities in basic science in our sewers, in our health, or lack of it, in our ecosystem, in our biodiversity, in terms of waste to energy, in terms of you know, energy development and so on, which can bring the best people all over the world to address these. And therefore, taking on, in each of these different ecosystems, specific, mis <coughs> specific missions of various kinds is something which can be done. I think a beginning on this, in terms of being a thin end of the wedge with our finance ministry, has come from the articulation in the economic survey, read chapter eight of the economic survey. It starts by painting a picture which is very dismal about the kind of funding and the kind of um, footprint of science which India has. And it's much more self-critical than ever before, and it, it points out what needs to be done. And this is the finance ministry speaking, right? Now I'll come to um, the next component, but it also points out what needs to be done in terms of uh, building um, a foundation for science. It doesn't put its money where its mouth is, but this is not to be underestimated. These documents are very important and gives you the strength to articulate programs for which you can get the resources. You know, you're not going to get resources for these kinds of things stated top down, saying so much money is allotted, people will try. But if you bottom up say, I want to do one of those things or similar things, then you will get one rupee for it and that one rupee will double and you know, quadruple and so on and keep on increasing. Just as the YIM started by an idea and, and, and people getting started with a zero budget, we should move away from putting money as the money up front as a requirement for these kinds of things. It's very good if it's there, we must argue for it, but we must put ourselves up front and we should do that a lot, lot more than we are. Thank you. To not be able to spread science the way it is. So I don't think that's an issue. The issue is, I mean, one, one should look at the way budgets, budget allocations are done. If you have a certain amount of money, and that's fixed, right, then you need to convince people that in a situation of immense pressure for immediate investment, which is apparently and clearly important, should one invest over there? And that's a battle which you win sometimes, you lose sometimes. And that's not some deep philosophical viewpoint. Everyone is unhappy with every budget, right? It's you're more or less unhappy. And you have to keep arguing. If there's massive growth, everyone becomes, uh, you know, more happy. So that's not, I'm not so worried about that. But we must constantly be at the front conveying what we need money for, rather than say, you know, to just say that India's GDP investment in science should be so much, without saying what you would do with it in detail is not sufficient. Nice talk, Vijay. You talk about the CSR story where they have given like mission project and all those things. That is one example. It's common everywhere. So we as a young investigator, where we are not the decision making body, we just convey the message and we have to follow that or whatever we have to do. So what we should do in that way to prevent those things to happen or at higher level what something done to revert back those decisions which have been taken? So, you know, the YIM is 10 years old, and the kinds of concerns returning postdocs, both postdocs or students or whoever from, or starting investigators had at that stage, are in many ways still the same concerns which we have now, except that those people who were complaining legitimately are on the other side of the table. So somehow we seem to be concerned, and this is human nature, about problems entirely from our perspective. We don't see the problems from other people's perspective. So we are responsible for this. All of us think that if I were in the in a next higher position, I would miraculously solve all these problems, right? And that doesn't happen and that'll never happen. You need to go to the position higher than that to solve it, and then the next one and so on. And even then it doesn't happen. And this is delusional to think that 
our problems will be solved by such a method. This, there is no victory in the battle against entropy, in the war against entropy. But you can win little battles. And that requires all of us to constantly be open about it. We should have a strong and open disrespect for authority. We, we don't have this within our institutions. We have this in a public space. We have no problem in complaining about the state of the world, right? But we don't have a mechanism within our institutions to have much more robust internal discussions and then accept whatever has happened and carry on. We, we, we should also have that latter component. And then Ron. To that, uh, what you said related to open and strong disrespect for authority, I would like you to deliberate upon specific gender aspect, like uh, being a faculty member and in initial few years of being a faculty, I have realized that uh, authority actually choose out uh, many uh, those opportunities which are coming to the institute. These are mainly given to people who are near to authority, which is definitely uh, well accepted, but there is a strong gender component related to it, like guys working late hours, more near to authority, given more chances. So is there a way we can tackle such things? Because it actually creates a lot of disrespect and a lot of uh, agony. And this is something which is widely prevalent in our institute. So I would like you to comment on this state of affairs. Well, first of all, um, this is absolutely true and it's a deeply flawed situation um, in our institutions for sure and perhaps, you know, to greater or lesser extent elsewhere, but it's certainly a big problem. It's a bit worse than what you say. I mean, if it were active discrimination, it recognizes your presence, right? But it can be a little worse than that because not even acknowledging your presence, right? And so there are fundamental challenges. My problem is, in, is what are the nature of the solutions? We need to again start solving. So this is, by the way, this is a problem across society. But I think science is fantastic in that in this aspect, it allows an opportunity for us to set an example to society. And the reason is that the structural flexibilities that science and scientific institutions have allows us to address this problem in a robust manner so that other parts of society, companies and so on, can emulate that. Companies today, for example, are motivated by a system which is essentially post-industrial, early industrial revolution, where well-dressed man is, is dressed up by his servants and family, goes to work 24 7 and there is basically a retinue of people ensuring that this person, this man can pay attention to his job right through, right? There's an economic cost in addition to the wrongness of this patriarchy, there's an economic cost behind this, right? That is, these people are working for this one person in the background, and that is not factored in into the economy. So unless an economic attitude also changes, and this patriarchy, patriarchy goes away, this fundamental change is not going to come, and it's, but it's happening. Science has the extraordinary flexibility that our science academies and our institutions, and we can start with each of our institutions, need to take a flexible view to these kinds of matters. And they range from important but small and doable aspects, such as when you schedule meetings, you know, how you um, schedule uh, allocations of leadership positions and so on, to more fundamental matters uh, in an institution. But I think the solution is, is doable in an institutional context, and we should not hesitate to be vocal about it and protect those who are vocal about it. But I think the solution comes from an institutional context as an example, and, and then goes on to other contexts. Ron. Yeah, the question regards um, how to 
create a better interaction from government. So you've been on both sides of that fence, and you mentioned that what government often hears are just complaints. Um, how does one, in, you know, getting down to real in practice, I mean, what are, is the message that you would carry of how to change that conversation at a practical level? I think this happens in the United States, too. I don't think this is specific to I India, but you know, I think many also people feel the government is impenetrable. Um, so let me give you an example of how some organizations have addressed this in their context. Industry wants laws which favor it, right? There are a whole lot of other interest groups environmental interest groups of one view or the other who want you know, this to be tweaked and that to be tweaked. What do they do? They fund interns to each member of parliament to work, go and do that member of parliament's work, but also educate that person about this area. Ensure that the right literature goes there, the right questions are asked, that this person goes and visits. We, as scientists, can do that. We can get our science academies to do that. We can have, get our engineering and health academies to do that. If INSA were to fund 100 fellowships for interns who will be trained as you know, political interns with our MPs and who shuttle between and have an institutional anchor, we're communicating something. Uh, but there are many such kinds of interactions at the state level, too, which we can do. Uh, would you like to give an office in your institution to your local representative, right? To come and learn about science, to send people from the constituency to learn about science, no matter which party the person belongs to. So there are many such efforts which I think our science academies can take the leadership. They are extremely well known today uh, for a very important job is to elect people who elect people who elect people. But in addition, I think this could be a very useful role. Uh, we talked about more of the science and research. So as a part of it, as a teaching is also a big component for the majority of the institutions. So how do you balance out the science policy in these matters? Because we need to teach the youngsters to attract a lot of people towards the science. Then we have another generation where we can take the global level challenges down the line. So that policies are weakening from the from the front side and the political side? So, I would be a bit careful about expecting us as individuals to do everything. You can't do top quality science and be a teacher and be a good citizen and do everything. Again, this is the granularity mistake which the filtering of messages from CSR did. The question in each of these situations is to ask what is the right level of abstraction to solve the problem? Is the Indian Institute of Science's new campus in, where is that? Chaligere, yeah. Which is supposed to be a national campus for teaching. Is that up and running to scale? Can, can that be a very attractive national level effort? which is exemplary. Can there be you know, four such campuses all over the country? So I would urge that we think not, I mean, if we want to go and teach individually, it's fantastic. But we also think about ways by which something can scale. Ron starting iBiology has transformed global learning in biology in a manner which, no matter how many lectures each of those individuals gave in their context, it wouldn't have. So scalability is important, and today with interesting technology, that scalability is feasible. Right, so really quickly, I'm, uh, I'm just really glad that the conversations that all three of you um, have had have sort of led us towards a direction of thinking what it means to imagine how we as scientists play a role in creating a scientific sort of common community and how we then relate to sort of um, other questions of the commons, as you put it. My question is, I mean, I'm sure everybody in this room and several people outside this room 
is interested in engaging with these questions, but I ask perhaps largely out of ignorance, uh, is there a forum where without being sort of in some committee or, you know, uh, or some sort of official process like that, can there be a common, some sort of common space where scientists can participate in thinking about science policy? And yeah. could one be set up if one doesn't exist? Yeah. So, um, let me first give you some examples in other contexts and potentially what the solution is over here. If you look at energy policy, foreign policy, industrial policy, economic policy in general, there are about, in India today, and this has happened over the last 10 or 15 years, a dozen think tanks of a range of opinions. They, depending on your, you know, position in the spectrum, you will join one of these think tanks. They provide you with, you know, a room and then you raise resources to propagate your viewpoint. And amazingly, every government relies on these for real hardcore analysis. Because the structure of governments are such, and this is true all over the world, that they have the data, but they don't have the nimbleness for analysis. Such science-oriented think tanks essentially don't exist. They're called the science academies elsewhere. They don't exist in India, right? Our science academies don't give policy inputs to government. How does it work in America? When the National Academy of Sciences were formed, I think during the Civil War, and they were tasked with giving this information, yet they were supposed to be independent. So the way they did that in America is to create a national, Ron will correct me, a National Research Council, which is, I would say, for uh, equivalence, I would say it's similar to NIAS, let's say, right? And the science academies take on big projects. The NRC gets the resources from government and private sector everywhere, organizes these committees, sits down, has the meetings, and a group of the academic fellows then go through everything and put in policy reports. And these policy reports are brilliant. The Royal Society by Royal Charter is supposed to do this, and again raises resources to do that. And they do this in an engaging, contentious manner. And this is true all over the world. So I think my problem in all these, when we ask for solutions, remember that the people who are supposed to provide the solutions are us only. Yeah? And we're not doing it. We're not doing it in our academies, we're not doing it in our institutions. To expect some, you know, our elected MP to miraculously see the light and do this is extremely unreasonable when our level of engagement has been extraordinarily modest. Um, I think we should be able to chart uh, the organizations that we have created, for example, India Bioscience, as being a site for the commons that, Absolutely. Uh, that, that so, you are to you're talking about. But unless we engage with the organization, it's not going to happen. So let me give an example. India Bioscience could be the equivalent of the NRC, which you know, can do the hard work. But India Bioscience is proposal comes up for renewal at the DBT, there is not one voice from the biology community in general, the committee members who are reviewing it, are against renewal, and it has to be a battle to get them, to persuade them to renew it. And it's us only there. So unless we are able to see a little beyond our nose in these matters, we are going to do ourselves no favor. Uh, yes, uh, I mean, I agree that, the, as you say, the solution has to come from us. So the question really was, is there something already? And if there isn't, you know, uh, it would be great, for example, at the 10th YIM, if there was some kind of resolution taken that the India Biosciences was to be some kind Oh, fantastic. So Sorry to jump the gun. Perfect, perfect, perfect start. And I think this is what we wanted. We wanted to start a discussion. And he has started it perfectly. Next question, please. I, uh, uh, Vijay, I was basically wondering, I mean, uh, given the issues that these science academies have, I mean, in India context, is it not possible to think of some sort of structural changes to be, you know, done with this and, uh, you know, because ultimately we are going to repeat these issues again and again in future. And given your understanding of the system now from a different position as well, 
Do you think there could be some structural changes that could be structural done? Structural changes. changes. So fell. my problem with structural changes is that, you know, I agree, you need a structure, but those structures exist. For everything you want, there is a structure already in place over the last 70 years. So they, some of them are functioning okay, some of them not so okay, some of them badly and so on. So the issue is not so much structural as the very difficult cha challenge of changing structures and sometimes new structures are easier to build than to change existing structures. So I'm not opposed like 100% to creating new structures. But there's, in addition to that, we need people taking charge of these kinds of issues. We live in an extraordinarily dumbed down democracy where every side of every argument gets equal time and there is no recognition of merit. If you're unable to recognize merit amongst yourselves, right, and put up someone as your leader, warts and all, you're going to suffer exactly as we are suffering. Everyone is not the same. Some people have the talent to do some things, put them in charge. If you want a committee to deal with this, that's the structure, then you have those committees already. You have the Council of the Indian National Science Academy. We, we can have some more questions. I mean, these are fine, these, these, these organizations, by the way, I'm not dissing them or anything, but if, if we, 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 it's us who is there, or some other organization and so on. Within the institutes, so that uh, I know the concerns are bottom-up approach happens. But really, in the absence of any particular mechanism in the institutes, how, how does such a thing work? There again, I would say in a very different context, take, you know, the yin, take I biology, right? There was no mechanism at that time. Take some of the institutions which have started. There was no mechanism. Things don't happen with a mechanism first, and only then I'll start. Batter at the doors, find a weak spot, and big edifices will come crumble. Without sounding negative. Well, you can. One important suggestion is no matter how negative or positive you are, pretend that you're normal, right? So <laughs> when you go to a committee, they think that you know, you're sensible. You may be angry, you may be upset, and so on and so forth. But you know, there are ways to get things done. You have to work the system. You know, it's, it's the whole network of structures globally is so huge that philosophizing about what is the right thing to be done and wishing it were done is not sufficient anymore. We need to go to every single node, little node, big node, and get something done. And that requires time and effort. So guys who put in that time and effort, whether they are successful or not, should be your representatives. Uh, and these people will be talented in some aspects and not so talented in others and so on and so forth. But you know, if, if we sh have a shared goodwill, uh, wonderful things will happen. Look at engineering, for example. We talk about alternate careers and so on and so forth. In engineering, being in academia is the alternate career. Dealing with the real world is, is the job. So biology should become that interactive with, with the real world in its own specific manner. And we should have you know, academic career paths as something which people come and go, but is, is incidental to the bigger picture. Hi, uh, Vijay. I wanted to ask you, uh, most of us wants to connect with, say, some national mission or something, but we really don't have an idea uh, how, ca how can our knowledge or our research connect to which mission and where to get that kind of understanding. If you could speak more so, about so, that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that's, that's, of course, coming down to specific, it's a tough one. Let me give you an example of uh, a challenge which was thrown about three or four years ago. It was a reinvent the toilet challenge, which was a global challenge from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And this was, can you make a toilet which is inexpensive, uses little or no water, is sustainable, and also attractive to use, no matter whether you're rich or poor. The toilet which won this, was by a group of astrophysicists and nanoscientists from Caltech, right? 
Now, why on earth, and these were, you know, this was a professor and, you know, a few members of their team and so on. Why did they take this up? Right? It's a waste of time from their perspective. They didn't have to. So that's one route to take. You know, actually get involved in some manner. And you don't have to be involved. Maybe someone else is. Maybe a group of people are. Let me give you an example which has happened in our own backyard. And we must admire. Mukund Thatte, I think sometime around the time the EM started, in 2008 or 9, was involved with the iGEM robotics um, competition, which, uh, sorry, iGEM competition, which is equivalent to the robotics, where you get little, um, you know, toolkits to make bacteria do all sorts of weird things, you know, jump up and climb, the, you know, and, and go and see the light and so on and so forth. An IIT Madras team, which he mentored, got a gold prize in some category. Sri Kumar Suryanarayan, who is an alumnus of IIT Madras and was in Biocon, worked with this group after that, sometime in 2009 or 2010, to persuade them to start a company looking at seaweed and making energy from seaweed. Those guys then incubated at Sea Camp much later, and that project to make energy from seaweed didn't work out, but they made a whole lot of extremely valuable secondary chemicals from that, for which they've got a huge investment. Now, to scale that company, they're trying to do that, and there is no law in India about how you can cultivate seaweed on scale, whereas Indonesia has a law, so they're going to Indonesia to start their company. So this is an example of how, you know, a pipeline of involvement of an individual can take this. You don't have to follow that model, you can follow something else. Two days back, I met, and I'm giving specific examples because these illustrate what one can do. Minhaj at NSTEM has developed a set of beautiful drawings with an artist in residence in his lab, illustrating how skin color can change in chameleons, octopuses, and so on and so forth. And these are beautiful illustrations with very little, you know, uh, written stuff, but that written stuff illustrates how, uh, you know, color changes can take place in these different contexts. And he wants to communicate this, but he's thinking of scaling this up by starting a company which deals with education uh, on a large scale. So there are multiple routes for being involved at an individual level, but I would say one route which works is to kick your institution to be involved, kick groups of institutions to be involved. Uh, you know, that's something which is not that difficult, but, you know, uh, is, is doable. I mean, Kolkata, I think, the institutions there were involved in, in some larger scale mission, it would be absolutely terrific. There's a great tradition of that. Hi. <coughs> Hello. Uh, so this is in connection with uh, what you just now said. So in the past five to ten years, compared to academics, there is no major growth in biotechnology industry per se. What do you think, like, it's stopping the growth of biotechnology industry compared to other industries in India? Because, like, it leads to a lot of uh, less job opportunities for people who are completing the biotechnology, which itself might be a major demotivation factor. In fact, I work in the university, and most of the B.Tech biotechnology students come there, finish off their project, and immediately move on to non-biotechnology related fields for the lack of opportunity. So as biotechnologists, what is it we can do to build up the industry sector in India? <clears throat> so in reality, the Indian biosimilars, generics, and vaccine industry have grown phenomenally. In terms of um, the size of the industry, the Indian vaccine industry is the world's largest. It does it as in, in a similar manner, the generics and the biosimilar industry, by being rather poor on innovation and rather high on mimicry. So what the vaccine industry will do, for example, will work with global philanthropy and get vaccines which have taken decades to develop by publicly funded money, let's say in the US, and that money will now be available for public good to this vaccine company. And Serum Institute, for example, has, I would say, saved something like 500,000 lives for a 
meningococcal vaccine in Africa? I mean, if, if there should be a Nobel Peace Prize for the numbers of lives saved, I mean, they've done a phenomenal job. CIPLA has saved, you know, HIV AIDS patients hugely all over the world. So these industries are big. The challenge today is with a dramatic change in the science, the carpet from under these big industries will be pulled from under their feet. And all of them rely hugely on China for a basic chemistry backbone uh, in multiple ways for bare bones products, which 15 or 20 years ago used to be made in India. China outcuts in terms of cost, and so we import that. So our chemistry industry has suffered hugely. So the solution to that is to try and bridge the gap in innovative areas. And the government has had a whole lot of startup scheme, uh, schemes and so on, which are you know, early stage. But what is interesting is a new mission, which is called a biopharma mission, which aims in academic environments to train these kinds of people, exactly as you said, so that they're industry ready anywhere in the world, in addition to trying to be successful in innovative science. So just as you have, you know, Indians in relatively modestly paying jobs all over the world, if the quality of this high-end training takes place, then Indians should be employable in high-tech uh, chemistry and biotech companies all over the world. So if universities want to part participate in the program which you just now mentioned, how do they go about it? Google Biopharma mission okay. and talk to Dr. Renu Sorup and don't tell her that I told you to talk to her. Sure. I'm just joking. Thank you. you can tell her. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask a, a question here. So, uh, as you know, that we have several themes, and many of them, the discussions possibly have already been initiated. We also hope that the end of the discussion in this entire meeting, we would be able to generate some white papers eventually, so that they can be converted into, uh, or they at least become a part, or they influence certain policy decisions. I just want a suggestion is that once we have that in hand, I think it will be very important to follow it up and uh, it should not just end up as one concluding remark in the meeting and what would you suggest? So very that simple, you very simple. This is an example of bootstrapping which I would suggest you do. Keep this idea of developing this white paper on all these topics completely confidential. Yeah, as it's possible with all of us. No one has, none of us is going to talk about this, of course. Yeah? Ask the Indian National Science Academy to ask India Bioscience to develop these white papers, right? And then push them, give them these white papers, and push them to take these as documents of the Indian National Science Academy to be pushed with the government. That carries a huge amount of clout, and that's an experimental <coughs> test of whether this cycle can work regularly. You have people from the inside here, uh, or will, will be coming, who are on the council. Uh, get them to ask them to write, saying that, you know, we would like to hear from you on policy matters pertaining to A, B, and C, D, and get that done in the next few days. That way, there's a lot of clout to that paper, which can have your stamp on it, but it's also something which then goes through um, and gives power to the academies in uh, policy analysis. Uh, you definitely feel that it holds promise? If you don't buy a lottery ticket, it's very unlikely you will win. If you buy it... We already it's, have a lottery you, ticket now. If you buy <laughs> it, it's also, if, if you buy it, it's still unlikely, but that's a finite, you know. All right. So we have some hope because we have the lottery ticket in hand. Uh, Vijay, I need to talk to you about a very important issue which I think many PI will appreciate, and that is the policy yeah. for the for the policy for the import export of the genetic uh, modified material like you know import of knockout mice animals and uh, drosophila strain or for example i have experienced in past that i tried my level best to get import my own generated knockout mice but because of the dgft issues which uh, actually which deals with this uh, document so can can dbt actually make a tie up with the dgft and uh, you know animal husbandry departments and uh, make a sign a mou that on the basis of iasc approval and the collab mutual collaboration between the recipient scientists and the center from the abroad this process can be minimized because we have some, not only me but many other friends of mine have faced this severe problem and which has sucked the interest of doing good quality research 
So this is again a, I mean, this is not something we should be discussing here, but a short answer to this yep. is, this has been formally done by a committee at the DBT, which doesn't require permissions for model organisms, and mouse is specifically one of those. So the problem is that other ministries, your trade ministry or your customs and so on, don't know of it. Whenever the institutions use that mechanism, they'll get it cleared. So the process is there, the pipeline needs to be oiled always. And if you don't use it often enough, it'll again go back. So catch me offline and I'll tell you who sure. to contact. Okay. What? Say it again? Yeah, yeah. It, it's, this yes, was, this yes, was yes. sent to all about two years ago and very few people have used it. Those who have have not had a problem, but I will tell you about it. No, the problem will comes, you know, when the DGFT toss, toss the file between DBT and Animal Husbandry Department, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, the yeah, main yeah, problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, that has been resolved and there will, all, there will still be a problem, but there is a government order which can solve it. But that you need to use that. Every customs officer who sees a mouse or a fly or a worm may or may not raise an issue. That's a separate matter. It's not going to become easy, but there is a document trail which allows you to argue it out over there in advance of the shipment. Yeah. Okay. Well, not I a question, a, a, a comment to many questions that I heard. I think Vijay and, and I were kind of put a challenge out that we need bottom up solutions, we need to think of ways in which individuals can organize within India extremely important, a valuable thing to do, that, you know, top-down solutions from Delhi are probably not going to be, in many ways, things are going to move India forward. But then several of you have asked, like, the same question, which is, good, I'm on board, what do I do? You know, how can we get organized? You know, you, you've now got our attention what do we do? I've heard that question, I think, from three of you, and I'm actually really excited that you've asked that question. And I think it's a little bit incumbent, not for us as a group, I would say, to think through that issue, because it would, we're not gonna solve it right now, but I, I, I think you've raised an important point that how, yes, bottom up, but how can we start getting organized and how can we do this in like more effective ways so I don't feel like I'm pushing this huge rock all by myself or at least find some friends to start pushing the rock. And after we push it a little bit, you know, is there a way in which that, that effort can be helped so the rock is now rolling? Um, so I, I think that deserves some attention. I think it would be nice to re-explore that later. And um, you know, maybe this group collectively can think of some ways to help all of you as a community. Because if we can't harness your energies, then that's energies lost. And I'm saying that because I do think there are probably more, I think there are solutions for this. Um, and maybe even some things that India Bioscience could do could act as, uh, as a nucleating agent. But I think it would be nice before we all leave that this meeting to really think about that because that will be an actionable item. Because, you know, there could be lots of great ideas that happen during these five days, but the question is, how do you advance them? And you know, I, I think reports are good. I think the white paper idea, I think getting some reports to government, I would say also that a deficit of the National Academy of Science and the NR, NRC, as much of the great work that they do, they bring together committees to write reports and there's no mechanism after that. You know, it, then it sits as a report and you know, five to ten years later, someone else does another report on the exact same issue. So, um, reports without the follow-through are also just reports. Um, so, anyway, I, I think, I just want to say, I think, 
got, got off to the right spirit that also all of you are thinking not passively but actively and I think that's you know that's a, a, a very important state of mind and we shouldn't lose it uh, we should you know learn to uh, you know harness that in productive ways so thank you I had one last I had one last comment actually and that was that what both Ron and Vijay have talked about are on two levels. One is very inspirational and the second is identifying a bunch of things where you need practical action. And I think both of them have touched on something, uh, the, the, the thread which goes through it is implicit, but I'd like to explicitly state it, which is it needs courage. Okay, there are many challenges. It needs courage of a sort that is, you know, essentially you're experimenting with your career. And I think that that's very important to recognize that that is, and you are not going to be that person all the time and every day. But if some part of your career can be experimental in this way, it can truly be transformational.